a couple of things before we pray. Um, you mentioned about head and heart, Joel. In his uh, literary critical work called The Arthurian Torso, a debt C.S. Lewis paid to his dear friend Charles Williams, one of the Wade authors and one of the Inklings, uh, Williams had written a cycle of poems on the Arthurian legend. And they're pretty obtuse. They're, they're, they're not the easiest things to understand. But once you have entry into those poems, I think that they're scintillating and breathtaking. And there's an image that Williams used that he borrowed from William Wordsworth's poem, The Prelude, of a Bedouin shepherd bringing along a stone in one hand and a shell in the other. The stone represented um, the mind and the shell represented the longings of the heart. And Lewis, when he's writing about this, says the first problem in life is how do you put the stone in the shell? How do you bring head and heart together? And Lewis had these rigorous questions of the head. He had these objectives or or, or, um, obstacles he had to get over intellectually. But he also had the heart longing that was goading him and motivating him. And when he becomes a Christian, he writes his first book as a Christian, which is The Pilgrim's Regress, an allegorical apology for reason and ro- for Christianity, reason and romance, because he felt that Christianity can bring together the head and heart. So it's interesting you have that as your motto. Second, um, you mentioned about Lewis being very charitable and giving, or did you mention it, Marge? I think you did. So, in fact, that was true. That was characteristic of his life. He gave away most of his income. He gave away all the money he made on his Christian preaching and his Christian books. Um, And that went into a trust called the Agape Trust. You'd think Lewis would know how to say agape properly, but nevertheless, (laughs) the Agape Trust. And... and, um, there's a famous story told, I, I, don't know, I thought it was Neville Coghill was walking with him, but somebody else told me it was Tolkien. They were crossing, I think, Broad Street in Oxford, and the panhandler came up and asked Lewis for some money, and Lewis just emptied his pockets and gave him everything he had in his pockets. And the, Lewis's friend said, why'd you give that guy money? He'll just go drink it. And Lewis said, yeah, but if I kept it, I'd drink it. <laughs> So he, he's, he's, a little more, he's a little more scrutinizing of his own motives than, than the other man's. But what I want to talk about this morning is communicating the gospel convincingly, the character of the evangelist and the love of God. Nobody ever gets upset about a grandmother pulling out the picture book of her grandchildren and sharing them. Nobody. She loves those kids. It just flows naturally from her. A few years back, the Cubs finally won after a a 104-year drought, I think. Nobody got upset at Cubs fans talking about the Cubs. I mean, they understood it. Nobody gets upset if a person who so deeply loves Jesus feels compelled to tell people about that love. And that's where I want to focus this morning. So let's... uh, Begin with a word of prayer. Father, it's one morning. Quickly upon us. Quickly it will pass. I pray, though, Father, somehow your Holy Spirit would have his way with us, that long after we can even remember where we heard or thought about the things we'll think about in this time, that your Spirit will still have his way with us, bringing these things to mind and letting them bring fruit in our life as we seek to serve you. For that to happen, we need you to work supernaturally, making the segue between the feeble words of one person to somehow connect to a complex number of hearts of people whose challenges are unique to their own experience. Oh Lord, I pray that you would make that segue and that every person at the end of our time together would leave full and leave encouraged and leave eager to let others around them know how deeply they are loved by you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Some of you have maybe heard me talk about this, but many of you haven't, and so I want to make sure I fill in the blank. This is like a prerequisite to where we're going to go, and I think you need to have this prerequisite. If it was a college course and you were going to do upper division courses, you'd have to have the prerequisite behind you. But before I talk about Lewis, Lewis, 
and the character of the evangelist and the love of God, I have to begin with a disagreement with Lewis. Lewis said that he thought pride was the great sin in mere Christianity, and I disagree with him. Not only that, St. Augustine said he thought pride was the great sin in his commentary on Psalm 19. So if I disagree with Augustine and Lewis, I confess I'm probably wrong. (laughs) Nevertheless, I do have to say Calvin is in my camp, and so also is uh, John Milton in his Paradise Lost. They hold a view similar to mine. So when, when Lewis and Tol, uh, uh, Augustine talk about pride as a great sin, they're, they're not talking about it. Um, uh, they, they speak of it as if it's the sort of axiom sin around which all of their sins constellate or the mainspring from which all of their sins are generated. I don't doubt that lots of sin can come from pride, but I'm not convinced it's the main sin. Um, and when I talk about pride, I'm not talking about pride of a job well done or pride that you take in your grandchild or your child if they do something well or a friend of yours. I'm talking about that form of pride that exhibits itself in some kind of pretense, making itself look better than it is. And in this regard, if Lewis and Augustine had written about pride as the apex of a pyramid, which could be the highest point in that pyramid, I could have signed on. But the apex of a pyramid always has things beneath it that are far more substantive until you get to the base. So what might this um, thing be that precedes pride? And I don't know what you think, but in my life, if I try to act better than I am, I've, I've usually found it's probably goaded by fear or insecurity. If you knew me like I was, you'd probably reject me or something. Well, if that's true then the scriptures give us explicit information as to what might be at the base of this pyramid. And it says in 1 John 4.18, perfect love casts out fear. So it seems to me the great sin might be living in neglect of God's love. If perfect love casts out fear, then a corollary could be drawn from that, that imperfect love, imperfect love breeds anxiety. You, know, you and I, we, we, we love human love as far as it goes. My guess is I've never been loved perfectly by another human being, and I suspect that because I know for sure I've never loved another person perfectly. So we long to be loved, but there's only one person who can love us perfectly. Why would we live in neglect of this? And it's very interesting to me that I think the great sin is to live in rejection of God's love. If I can, if I can give uh, some sort of embodiment of this, I was on an airplane one time and I saw a movie and I'm a high T on the Myers-Briggs, so I kind of live in my head. But in this particular film, um, there was a moment where all of a sudden I caught myself weeping. Now, Lewis says in Experiment and Criticism that the people who are um, the literary receive literature. They may want to think critically about it, but they want to make sure that they've received the book, that they've inclined towards a book before they start thinking critically about it. We could say the same thing with film or poetry or, or, or maybe even a concert that we hear. Lean into it first. Once you've got the whole message, then begin to think critically about it. So if I see a movie and I find myself deeply moved, I want to go back and visit that scene. Why did that scene touch me so deeply? So the movie that I have in mind, I can't recommend a movie I've seen on an airplane because I don't know how much they've sanitized it for an airplane audience. But nevertheless, the movie I have in mind is the movie The Notebook. Now, almost always when I mention that film, everybody laughs because they know it's a chick flick. And I want you to know I'm secure enough in my masculinity that I can watch a chick flick. It's okay. So here's this movie. And follow with me to the scene where I lost it. You have this old man and he's going to a rest home. And he's going to read a story, and he walks up to this woman. She's very standoffish to him. And the picture that is depicted is that this old woman has some sort of dementia, and this old man in his retirement goes to the old folks' home and reads stories to the old people. And the whole movie is present time, this old man, James Garner, and this old woman, Gina Rollins, and him reading story in present time and the story that is depicted past time. And and the story pastime is about a a young boy and a young girl 
in a village in South Carolina someplace. The girl's family have come to vacation at a lake, and they, they are very wealthy if they could vacation for the summer at this lake. And this boy lives in this town, and a relationship gets to uh, develop, but there's so much that counts against the relationship ever really coming to any kind of fruition. She comes from incredible wealth. He is very, uh, from very modest background. He has a high school diploma, and he likes reading the poetry of Walt Whitman, but she has the best education her parents' money can afford. Uh, not only that, her family's intact, mother, father, and the daughter. There's a lot of pretense there. The boy, on the other hand, not much pretense, but the family's obviously broken. The mother's not in the picture. We don't know if she died or if she abandoned the family. Just so many things that count against this relationship working. And then all of a sudden, uh, as they get ready to leave town, the girl's parents are not happy about this relationship. And they're eager to get her out of town. And the boy running after the car, crying to the girl who's in the car crying, he says to her, I'll write to you every day. The mother hears this. So every day she's there to intercept the letters and keep the daughter from getting the letters. The boy writes to her every day and never hears back from her. She said he said he would write to me every day, and she never hears from him. Then World War II breaks out, and now circumstance separates them even further, geographically and circumstantially. But it's about this time in the movie that the director tips his hand, and you realize it's this old man and this old woman's story. And every day he comes to tell her the story. And there comes a scene right towards the end of the movie where the two of them are sitting having a dinner at the hospital with a nice uh, tablecloth on the table. There's a rose and a bud vase. There's a candle burning. There's a record player playing all of the music that had informed so much of their relationship. And the whole environment pulsates out to this woman, the love of this man for her. And he finishes the story that he's been reading the whole day. And it's at that particular moment that the woman looks at him and says, that's the most beautiful story I have ever heard. And it sounds so familiar. And all of a sudden, cognition washes across her face. And she says, it's our story, isn't it? He says, yes. She says, how much time do we have? He said, last time it was five minutes. She says, how are the children? That's a question a mother would ask, isn't it? He said, they're fine. They came to see you today. She says, tell them I love them. He says, I will. And then as the music is playing, she says, hold me. Can we dance? They begin to dance across that hospital floor. And as quickly as she came into cognition, she falls out of cognition, finds herself in the arms of a stranger, and just begins weeping and screaming and afraid. The orderlies have to come in and sedate her. And James Garner's character, watching it all, backs up against the wall, biting his knuckle, and he is just weeping. And it was at that moment I totally lost it. So now going back after seeing the film, what was it about that scene? And I realize this is all of our story. We are all part of this love relationship that has so many things counting against it. Looks like it will never work. And yet constantly we are being told and pursued by the one who loves us so deeply. How deep is his love for us? And we live most of our lives as if we're in dementia. And there come those moments when cognition comes and we understand. And then some little inconvenience, some niggly little thing bothers us. And we fall out of cognition as quickly as we've fallen into cognition. And I think that that story was so moving because it's basically all of our story. Again, Calvin had this view. Um, Calvin said, Never would Adam have dared to show any repugnance to the command of God if he had not been incredulous as to his word. The strongest curb to keep all his affections under due restraint would have been the belief that nothing was better than to cultivate righteousness by obeying the commands of God and that the highest possible felicity was to be loved by him. And Milton says the same sort of thing, that disobedience to God was preceded by doubts about God's love and paradise lost. Nevertheless, I don't want to beat up on Lewis too much, but using this contrast, especially as we think about evangelism, it should be an outflow of the believer's love for God. 
like the grandmother who pulls out the pictures. Lewis wrote, every mature Christian would agree that a man's spiritual health is in direct proportion to his love for God. Furthermore, in mere Christianity, Lewis said, I cannot learn to love my neighbor as myself until I learn to love God. And I cannot learn to love God except by learning to obey him. This is interesting. In Lewis's anthology of George MacDonald, he has a quote from MacDonald where MacDonald said, Obedience is the opener of eyes. I think this is important because disobedience is the closing of eyes. Um, Aristotle, when he writes about uh, moral behavior in the Nicomachean Ethics, he says, if I do a bad thing, my tendency will either be to change or to rationalize or justify the bad thing. Aristotle calls it akrasia. It's a Greek word, and it means to be uh, without command of my moral life. Um, C.S. Lewis put it this way in his preface to Paradise Lost, continued disobedience to conscience makes conscience blind. Or Paul said, we suppress the truth in our unrighteousness. So obedience starts to open our eyes. We begin to see. Matter of fact, I would say when Jesus says, go and tell the world about me, there's a lot of clarity that comes as we begin to share the gospel with other people. Um, And we grow, and we learn from our mistakes, and we mature in this process. But I think it has to be driven by a sense of God's great love for us, and we'd want to tell others about it. In his letters to children, Lewis basically says that obedience is like a crutch or a splint put on a broken leg that it might mend. Or I would suggest to you another way to understand it. Obedience avails for me all the benefits of omniscience. I do not know very much. I am a pea brain. Folks, all of us are. Go to the Harvard, uh, to Widener Library in Harvard. There's 19 million volumes under that one library roof. Who's read them all? We just don't know very much, you see. And, and, and so here God tells me to obey something, and I may not understand why. But somehow, as I obey, clarity starts to follow. And somehow, too, as I obey, I realize I, as a pea brain, am living in the benefits of omniscience. I'm living beyond my capacities at that particular time. It might be inferred that the character of the evangelist will be best benefited by cultivating first a love for God. And this will likely prompt one also to love his or her neighbor, and certainly prompt a desire to obey the Great Commission, which puts us in step with God's mission to love others to himself. Now, I mentioned last night that Stephen Olford said that um, that, uh, Lewis preached like an English grocer. Now, I need to be cautious about that because we're going to hear a sermon tonight, um, uh, The Weight of Glory. And I knew a woman who was there, Anne Scott. I wrote her obituary for seven years ago. She was a member of the Oxford C.S. Lewis Society and a delightful person. She was also the person that Charles Williams modeled his poem, The Queen's Servant, that appears in in, uh, his uh, Regions of the Summer Stars or one of those, one of the Arthurian poetry books. She was there, and she said the place was packed. Everybody was there. No room in any of the pews. People were sitting on the floor. People hung on every word. And we hear this over and over again. That He was the most popular lecturer at Oxford University when he was there. So whatever Stephen Olford thought, I want you to know the Oxford University students thought a little bit differently at that time. But nevertheless, in the weight of glory, in this particular sermon that we're going to hear tonight, Lewis begins, if you ask 20 good men today what they thought the highest of virtues, 19 of them would reply unselfishness. But if you asked almost any of the great Christians of old, he would have replied love. Love was the highest virtue. Love is that thing which uh, causes our heart to pursue God. Love is the thing that causes our heart to be concerned for the welfare of another person. Makes perfect sense when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love God and love your neighbor. Lewis continues in the weight of glory, unselfishness carries with it the suggestion, not primarily of securing good things for others, but of going without them ourselves, as if abstinence and not their happiness was the important point. The New Testament has lots to say about self-denial, but not about self-denial as an end in itself. 
The weight of glory continues with the discussion of longing. Lewis calls it the inconsolable secret. Nostalgia, romanticism, the secret we cannot hide and cannot tell, though we desire to do both. But Lewis isn't alone in talking about this deep longing of the heart that pursues some object that isn't always fully given and certainly not always perfectly clear. Augustine said, Our hearts are restless, O God, till they find their rest in thee. Pascal called it the secret instinct. He said, We have an idea of happiness, but we cannot reach it. How many of you have heard Pascal said, We have a God shaped vacuum that can't be filled by? I have never found that in Pascal. I've read virtually everything he wrote, and I've never found it. But what he does say is, We have a God shaped abyss, an infinite abyss that can only be filled by an infinite object, God Himself. Schleiermacher called it the feeling of dependence. Rudolf Otto called it the creature feeling. G.K. Chesterton said we're homesick in our own homes. Sociologist Peter Berger called these things signals of transcendence that remind us in our own heart that there's some object that we pursue. Um, and, and David Downing, I don't know if he's here right now, but David Downing in his book, the great book, probably the best thing that's been written on the on the space trilogy, Planets in Peril, said if Christian doctrine teaches all humans are exiles from paradise, then how natural that they should feel pangs of longing, painful yet pleasurable, in that they point to genuine realities in which they may someday partake. Or as Paul said, we're citizens in heaven. And consequently, as citizens in heaven and lovers of our ultimate home, How easy it is then for us to be deployed as ambassadors of heaven, ambassadors of Christ, given the word of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Lewis's favorite fairy tale, he writes to Arthur Greaves, not long after he became a Christian, was George MacDonald's um, The Golden Key. And the golden key is about a boy named Mossy who happens to find a golden key in fairyland at the base of the rainbow. You thought it would be a pot of gold from some leprechaun or something like that. But no, it was a golden key. And when Mossy finds this, he's joined by a young girl named Tangle. And the two of them are pursuing, what does the key open? Where is that lock? And Lewis believed this was the story of all of us. We have this sense of longing. And we're in pursuit of its proper object. Lewis said this in The Weight of Glory. These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past, are good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn to dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself. They're only the scent of a flower we have not yet found, the echo of a tune we have not yet heard. News from a country we have never yet visited. Do you think I'm trying to weave a spell? Perhaps I am. But remember your fairy tales. Spells are used for breaking enchantments as well as for inducing them. And you and I have need for the strongest spell that can be found to wake us from the evil enchantment of worldliness. In another place, Lewis talks about the dialectic of desire, the longing of the heart, and how we tether it to some object. And it doesn't fulfill us, so we untether. Tether it to another object, it doesn't fulfill us. Untether, tether it to another object, it doesn't fulfill us. In his essay talking about bicycles and present concern, he says there's four phases of enchantment. To be unenchanted. Second phase, to be enchanted. Something awakens desire. Maybe it's as silly as a toy garden on the lid of a biscuit tin, as was Lewis's case. Who knows what it might be? But it awakens in us longing. And then we think that thing will satisfy us only to be disappointed because it can't. The things that moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal cannot ultimately satisfy us. So we come to the third phase, which is to be disenchanted. And then one day, through the dialectic of desire, we finally realize, as Lewis says in Mere Christianity, if we discover in our hearts a longing that nothing in this world could satisfy, that doesn't mean the world is a fraud. It may have been to awaken the desire, but ultimately it sets our hearts longing for that which is eternal, transcendent, ultimate, for our heavenly home. When that longing is invasive in our hearts, my guess is we'll start talking about it. This love that God has for us. Uh, Lewis writes 
excuse me, and the weight of glory, our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures. We're like children who sit around making mud pies in the street, in the alleyway behind us, and not even realizing that a vacation at the sea is offered to us. In John 6, Jesus said to those who heard him, those who he had fed, I am the bread of life. I give you myself. Take me. Find your satisfaction ultimately in me. I give you myself. My guess is the evangelist who hasn't found that longing fulfilled in Christ, they're, they're not going to talk about God with much enthusiasm and certainly not with much authenticity and certainly not with much convincingness in their presentation. Lewis more than once references Julian of Norwich. He liked her writings, the medieval mystic. She was a contemporary of Chaucer's. During the days of the plague, she had gotten very sick. She, she was in a coma. When she comes to, she says God came to her and spoke to her. I, I don't have problems with this. I, I've met four Muslims, met them myself, who all, each one came to Jesus because God came to them in dream and vision. You got dreams that Joseph has in the Old Testament. You got dreams that Jesus' earthly father had in the New. I don't doubt that these things can happen. He even says in the last days, your young men will dream dreams and your old men will see visions. I think this stuff can happen. It only becomes problematic if the dreams are contradictory to what the scriptures have clearly said. But nevertheless, um, Julian of Norwich said that when she was... Um, uh, in a coma, that God came to her, and the Divine Revelations is the book that Lewis wrote by her, sometimes called Divine Showings. She said that God came to her, Jesus came to her, and said to her, all the great truths of the world could be found in something as small as the chestnut. Um, and actually, she said hazelnut, but the first time I read it, I remembered chestnut, and so I got it wrong all these years, but nevertheless... <laughs> Nevertheless, every time I saw a chestnut after this, I remembered what she said. All the great truths could be found in something so small as this. What are the three truths? God made it. God sustains it. God loves it. I have never looked at a chestnut since then without listening to the message that comes. I, I, I can't help but think that that's the way we should be living our life all the time anyway, right? Right? Uh, Lewis says, God walks everywhere incognito. What we need to do is awaken to him and even more remain awake to him. Elizabeth Barrett Browning says, uh, every bush is a burning bush and the world is crowded with God. So here's a hazelnut or a chestnut. God made it. God sustains it. God loves it. Now, I, I remember one time I was uh, walking to the post office from my office at the Billy Graham Center here. And, and, and I was walking across the parking lot at College Church, and I looked down, there was a chestnut. There's no chestnut trees around there. There was a chestnut. How did it get there? Maybe a bird carried it and wearied of its weight and dropped it. Maybe somebody got out of a car at a Bible study over there and knocked a chestnut on the floor. But I picked it up, put it in my pocket, and I said, God, you made me, you sustained me, you love me. I went on to the post office. On my way back, I was coming through that same parking lot, and a car pulls up, and I hear a voice from the driver's side of the car, I couldn't see who it was. And he said, Jerry, do you need a ride? And it was a, a guy, and I looked in, it was Nate Castle. I did Nate and Susie's wedding, performed their wedding 12 years earlier. I had been following Nate's story, but I hadn't seen him in a year. He had gotten cancer of the jaw. And they had to remove his jaw, the bottom part of his face just hung there. They took what's a small bone in the leg, the fibula. They took the fibula and they refashioned a jawbone for him and his body rejected it. They took his other fibula. He's only got one more leg. He's not an insect. And they fashioned another jawbone. They did teeth implants. He had no visible um, deformity of his face. I hadn't seen him all this time, but Claudia and I had been praying for him. I said, Nate, I don't need a ride, but I'm going to get in the car and take a ride from you because I just want to connect with you. How are you doing? He said, it's been the toughest year of my life, Jerry. And he told me his story. At that moment, I reached into my pocket, and there was a chestnut, and I pulled it out, and I said, Hey, um, let me tell you about this. God made it. God sustains it. God loves it. And, and, and Nate, you know what he said to me? Can I keep the chestnut? Can I keep the chestnut? So I was speaking in all-school communion a couple months later. 
And I shared that story at the All School Communion. Then came Christmas. On my birthday, just before Christmas, I had a, the, a, the only bad, I've been connected with Wheaton College for 38 years. And I only have one sad story. This is a great place to work. Cut me, I bleed blue and orange. <laughs> but one sad story. I got fired from Wheaton College on my birthday. And I came back from the meeting, and it, it got straightened out. It all got straightened out. Matter of fact, as soon as it got straightened out, I got rehired and got a $7,000 raise. I should do it with more frequency. <laughs> but I was down, really down. And pretty much everybody had left for Christmas break, and I go to my office, and, and, and I've got to drop off some books, and I've got to go to another meeting. It's going to be just as sad as the one I just came from. And there's a woman standing in the hallway. I didn't know who she was. And I go into my office and all of a sudden she comes in, follows me in the office. I said, please forgive me. I I, I don't have uh, time to visit really. I've got to go to a meeting, but let me pray for you. And I prayed for her. And as soon as I said, amen, I said, please forgive me. I've got to go. She puts her hand out like this. I put my hand underneath hers and she dropped three walnuts in my hand. I said, what are these? She said, I couldn't remember what kind of a nut it was. I said it was a chestnut. God made it. God sustains it. Her voice joined mine. God loves it. I said, why did you come just now to tell me this? You could have come two weeks ago. It wouldn't have meant as much to me. You could have come two weeks from now. Probably wouldn't have meant as much to me. But I needed to hear this this moment. I needed to hear this. All all the people that you see in the world need to hear that God made them, God sustained them, God loved them. And they all need to hear it all the time. So fast forward years later, uh, we have uh, 14 grandkids, a 15th on the way, four married kids, and they're with in-laws one Christmas and they're with us the next Christmas. And the off Christmases, we go with a couple who are dear friends of ours someplace in the world to sort of lick our wounds when our kids aren't with us. <laughs> so one year we were in Cambridge, England with Malcolm Guy. You probably know Malcolm. And, and um, because it was right near Norwich, I'd never been to Norwich, I said, let's go see Julian and Norwich's uh, shrine. So we went to see it. Have any of you been there, Norwich? We go to her shrine. She lived in a little room. She was an anchoress. She did spiritual direction when people come to her window. There was a brick she could take out to see the Eucharist service in the church, and they would hand her the elements through the brick hole in the wall. You know what her, her, she's, her remains are buried there. You know what her, her gravestone says? Thou art enough to me. Thou art enough to me. My guess is, if we don't discover that in our lives, our sharing the gospel will not be as profound, and I don't believe, too, it will probably be as convincing. What is all this to do with evangelism, C.S. Lewis's style? The weight of glory begins with the love of God and longing and ends with my responsibility to encourage my neighbor towards eternal glory. Towards the end of the sermon, there's a comment drawn from Dante's The Divine Comedy. He says, Beauty has smiled, but not to welcome us. Her face was turned in our direction, but not to see us. What what, what is that image all about? As Lewis writes about it. Well, Dante, his first book, most people don't read it, was a Vita Nuova. New life. He talks about being on the streets of Florence and seeing a young girl, Beatrice Portinari. Somehow she ignited a candle in his heart. He only saw her maybe a dozen times in his life. But what was that all about? She ends up marrying somebody. He ends up marrying somebody else. He has his children by this other woman. And I, I remember when I first heard about this with Dante, I thought he was kind of a chump holding a candle for somebody else all these years. And then all of a sudden I find out Lewis thought Dante was the greatest poet. And Charles Williams had written that book, The Figure of Beatrice. I read it. Oh my, it was breathtaking. And then he talked to Dorothy Sayers, who had a schoolgirl knowledge of Dante. And she 
is encouraged to go read Dante again. She likes it so much, she goes and learns Italian so she can read it in the original. Imagine that. And she does the first English translation, maintaining the, the same rhyme scheme as the Italian. Oh, wow. The Vita Nuova, new life. He meets Beatrice Portinari, but what is that about? 25 years later, after he writes the Vita Nuova, he writes the Divine Comedy. He has Virgil, who represented for him the highest of, of literary value, the longing, and so on. And Virgil leads him through the Inferno, halfway through the Purgatorio. And then Beatrice comes out of heaven. She's died, and she collects him. Lots of adventures are going on. But she collects him and leads him the rest of the way through the Purgatorio on into the presence of, of God himself. Dante writes, when they get to the very threshold of the vision of God, she turned to look, but not at me. She turned to the eternal fountain. This is the reference in the weight of glory. By the way, C.S. Lewis fell in love and married late in life. I, I, I'm convinced Joy went after him, aren't you, Marge? Yeah. And some people try and trash her for that. But actually, I think she gave him three and a half of the best years of his life. Lewis, you know, Lewis said, I, I, I like chocolate more, but I, when I was a kid, I always bought toffee because it lasted longer. He says, I'm a play it safe guy. He didn't like to take risks. If he's marrying this woman on her deathbed, if the marriage doesn't work out, it's okay. It's not going to last long. <laughs> but she recovers and gives him great years. And his heart goes out to her, and he loves her deeply. And now all of a sudden, she's taken. And he writes about it in a grief observed. You know the book. What are the last lines of that book? They're in Italian. And it says, translated, she turned to look, but not at me. She turned to the eternal fountain. All our love, properly understood, should draw us closer to the archetypal lover of our lives. And this is remarkable. And I think that this is something we have to understand if we're going to understand evangelism according to Lewis's lifestyle. The character of the evangelist should be one infused with the love of God. And, and, and this is something, too. Um, rhetoric, Lewis says, I'm a rhetor. One of his letters, he says, I'm Irish, so naturally I'm a rhetor, right? Because the Irish like to talk, tell stories. Wonderful part of the Irish. I have glorious Irish friends here. Great storytellers. But ret rhetoric is persuasion. Whether I want you to pass me the salt at the table at Thanksgiving or I want you to vote for my candidate in the next election. I'm talking to you to persuade you. Well, there's a risk then, isn't there? When the Gorgias is written by Plato and it starts with rhetoric, they move immediately then to justice, because a persuasive person better be just. Lewis, I think, was affected by this. He saw the problem. It was, it was Trollope, Anthony Trollope, in his book, Barchester Towers, says, only the preacher can compel people to sit still and be tortured. <laughs> I know this isn't true. We professors do it far better. We hold grades over students' heads. The question is, how do you persuade without being manipulative? And Gorgias has to move from rhetoric to justice. Persuasive person better be a just person. Let's say do it. How did Lewis do it? You read his books. And what do you get from those books? You get the idea of the posture of a man who's turning shoulder to shoulder with his readers. And he's describing some reality out here with such clarity and precision with such imaginative depiction, fleshing out the bones of these precise rhetorical words and the logic and so on, with story that awakens our imagination and helps us to see with the mind's eye what maybe we can't see with our eyes of flesh. And all of a sudden, as Lewis describes this thing shoulder to shoulder, we don't depend upon him. And he hasn't made us dependent upon him. He hasn't manipulated us. He's made us fascinated with the thing itself. He leaves, and we're still all in, all in. And how do you do that unless you love the thing so deeply that you describe it so well? What can 
we make of this. To do evangelism Lewis style, we must keep in the love of God. That's the first and foremost thing. I could embellish this a hundred ways, but I think we're running out of time. I don't know what time we're supposed to end. Huh? Okay. So, rather than going into great detail of how we can em- embellish this further, let me just give you one example uh, of sharing Christ Lewis style. And then we'll open it up for a little question and answer. Um, I was coming back from a theology conference. It was about a year ago. And I had read a paper on Lewis at this theology conference. And I got on the plane. It was in San Antonio, Texas. I got on the plane to fly home, and I'm sitting by the window. A minute later, a guy comes and sits down right next to me, and he says, rats, I've got a middle seat. I'm sure if I would have been uh, totally given to loving God and loving people the way I should have, I would have given him my seat, but I didn't. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still a person in process. So then the guy comes and sits by the aisle, and he looks over and he says, Professor Root. And I said, you've got the drop on me. I'm sorry, I, I don't know you. And he said, I was just at your paper at the theology conference. So the two of us start talking a little theology and a little C.S. Lewis, and I got this guy in the middle seat. <laughs> so I turned to him and I said, please forgive us. What's your name? He said, Sean. I said, Sean, please forgive us. We were just at a theology conference and we don't mean to talk over you. Please feel free to be a part of this conversation. A few more minutes talking with uh, Travis on the, on the aisle. I turned to Sean. I said, Sean, are you a spiritual person? He said, I am. I am. I said, tell me about that. He said, I went and studied with a shaman once in Peru. Don't be dissuaded by hearing something like this. Don't say, oh, you know, what are we going to do? That shows some sort of spiritual hunger. That shows a guy looking for something. He's in the state of tethering and untethering, the dialectic of desire. So I said, Sean, tell me about that. He said, I saw an advertisement. I could go study under a shaman. So I saved my money. I got my vacation time saved up. And I went for three weeks to Peru. And I was with a shaman for the whole three weeks learning all this stuff. I said, and how'd that go for you, Sean? He said, it was the worst money I ever spent in my life. (laughs) He said, what's in it for you, Jerry? I said, Sean, what's in it for me is this. I am overwhelmed that the God of the universe loves me unconditionally. I don't know a person who's lived a moment of honest life who isn't moved by the desire to want to be loved unconditionally. Human love is good as far as it goes, but it can't go far enough. And if we don't know this kind of love, we still feel um, bereft. And not only that, if we've lived honest life, we know we're messed up. We believe in the high ideal of love. We have sharp words of people we say we love most in the world. We're messed up. And here's this love that reaches out to us in all of our cesspools that we've made for ourselves. And he still loves us and forgives us of all of our sins. And he's willing to enter into our life as Lord of our life and make order of the chaos. Sean says to me, that is the most comforting thing I have ever heard in my life. And I said, Sean, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to trust Christ right now? He said, none. And he prayed with me right there on the plane to go home, uh, on, on the way home. Sort of looking up the luggage racks as if maybe he thought Jesus was up there someplace. It was interesting because Travis, who's sitting on the aisle, he was a PhD student at Trinity Seminary in apologetics. He was freaking out. <laughs> He was used to defending the faith. He wasn't used to obstetrics. <laughs> and Travis turns to him and loves on him the whole rest of the way back, beginning follow-up with, with uh, Sean. Is that cool or not? I think it grows not out of stress, not out of difficulty, but sensing one is deeply loved and looking to the one who loves us. And just trying to say to the person we meet, God made you. God sustains you. God loves you. Any questions? 